Okay, I'm sorry. I'm you, sorry out there. I get no respect. Anyways, welcome to uh, Freedom's Light Church of God, better known as Freedom's Light Church here in Ball Ground, Georgia, and uh, it is Pentecost Sunday. Now, I'll say this about Pentecost Sunday. It's just a set date as of, you know, the last thousand years or so. I can't remember when the, um, when the Jews actually set the date because they lost the date, and it was lost because the temple was burned. And Pentecost was always either on the 5th, 6th, or 7th, and I believe the Hebrew month is called Savan. Is that right? Something like that. I may be mispronouncing it. But it was always 50 days after Passover, on the first Sunday after Passover, the regular Passover, not the high Passover, or I mean uh, the Sabbath, not the midweek Sabbath. That was Passover during when uh, Christ was the sacrifice. But he rose on the first day of the week was first fruits. That being said, it's somewhere in this general area, and I do believe that when the rapture happens, it will be during the Feast of Pentecost because it fits the type of what Christ is going to do when He gathers the harvest. Also, it's known as the judging of the fruit of the trees. Isn't that interesting? That's the judgment seat of Christ. I think that's what that's referring to because we're judged by what we did with what God gave us and the fruit that we bore in His service. The judgment seat of Christ is not about whether you'll make it into heaven because you're already there. It's about rewards. It's not about tears. That being said, um, we're going to just praise the Lord and do His work and continue to follow Him and be used and led by the Holy Spirit until He comes and calls us out. Amen? And uh, after I'm done with these announcements, we're going to pray for our country. Um, we are in dire straits. This country is more divided now than it ever has been. And it's not because of the president. It's not even because of the president we had before, which he did enough to divide. It's about the lack of this nation's commitment towards God. We have left God out and we are reaping the results. This is not the judgment of God. I don't believe it's the judgment. Judgment's going to happen, but that's um, going to really be poured out when the wrath of His indignation is fulfilled or full during the tribulation. But the Bible's clear, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. And that also is for nations. So when a nation turns its back on God, and we have for two generations now raised kids where the bottom line is this focus has been on them to the point where they're so selfish, so focused on themselves that they're willing to tear down the only government that has, mankind has had that's ele actually elevated mankind to a position where we could be um, uh, reap the fruits of, of the blessings of God upon us as individuals and corporately as communities and a nation. But when a nation turns its back on God, this is the fruit of that. We don't have to go down a litany. You know what happened in 62, 1962? Prayer was removed out of schools in 1963. Bible reading was moved, removed out of schools in 1973. We had Roe v. Wade made abortion legal. And by the way, most abortions still occur. Most abortion clinics are in minority neighborhoods. Think about that. They purposely target the minorities. African Americans especially are targeted through abortion. You want to be marching, march against Planned Parenthood and march against these Democrats, these socialists, I call them communists, and this is not just strictly Democrat or Republican because there's a lot of Republicans haven't done right either. But it goes back to when you have a society that's based on man being the center of everything, and that's what the Progressive Democratic Party is about. It's about pushing a socialist, communist agenda. You look at our cities that are burning, every one of them have been controlled by progressive liberals for at least decades. And I'm talking about 20, 30, 40, maybe even longer than that. It's ridiculous seeing what's happening in our cities. This is more than about what happened to uh, George Floyd was horrible. It's, anybody with uh, any type of uh, human, humanity about them, any decency, will realize what that was was murder. It was wrong. But can I tell you something? For those of you that are looting, your purpose, we know what your purpose is, those of us on this side of the aisle, we understand that your purpose is to destroy this country. And listen, if you're out there looting and robbing and stealing, 
You are the problem, not the answer. Amen. Amen? So, I could go on about that, but my, uh, what I got to deliver this morning in the message has got nothing to do with that directly, but indirectly it does. Amen? So remember Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m., and we're doing live streaming, so those who can't make it, and, uh, and uh, pass that on to your friends, your families, and neighbors, especially shut-ins. They need to hear the Word of God. They need encouragement just as much as we do. Amen? And then the preppers, and that's the, uh, the, stu the um, study that's on the second and fourth Thursday of each month at 10.30 a.m. here at church. And that's uh, not about prepping, uh, getting your bunker ready to go through the tribulation. That's a bunch of nonsense because if you understand the technology that exists today, there's no place to hide. Absolutely none. They can see well deep into the ground. They can detect that there's human beings there. There's no place to hide anymore. And with drones, no matter where you are, you could be in the most remote area in Alaska. Once they find you, they can take you out. So, the preppers is preparing your heart to be with Jesus Christ. Like us then, I would, if you would, on Facebook and share our live services and daily devotions. And I want to say thank you for those that are watching online and thank you for those that are being here. But let's continue to invite our friends and neighbors. Time is of the essence. And what I mean by that, Jesus Christ is literally on the verge of coming back and getting His church out of here. Because we are not appointed under wrath. But I'm telling you, as bad as things look now, it's a cakewalk. It's a picnic. It's a pleasure stroll through the park on a Sunday afternoon compared to what's about to be poured out upon this world. And it's a world that is shaking its fists in the face of God. And judgment is coming. So warn those. And look circumspectly at, at yourself to make sure that you are where you need to be. And that is in Christ. Amen. So let's worship with the Lord, um, and we just thank Him for His mercies and His grace and His love. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Oh, it's good to be here this morning.
Thank you. 
Jesus. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Is he your risen king? Is he everything to you? Then let's sing it one more time and sing it to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sing it as a prayer out of your heart because he has won the victory. Whatever you have need of, whether it's physical healing, whether it's finances, whether it's just an overwhelming presence of the peace of God to fill your heart, Jesus Christ has won it all on Calvary. Amen. Sing it. He's worthy. Amen. Glory be to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit who intercedes on our behalf through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this. In Christ's lovely name, glory be to the Lamb of God. Praise his holy name. Can I have an usher come forward, please? Thank you, Jesus. Before we get started, Shannon needs a touch in his body. He needs a miraculous healing in his body. Amen. And Jesus took those stripes. Isaiah said, by his stripes, we are healed in the present. Peter reminds us, pointing back to the cross and the stripes that Jesus Christ took, those 40 lashes for the healing of this body, the blood purchased, the glorified body, which we will receive at the rapture and the resurrection of life. We that are alive and all those, even those that have gone before us, will receive the glorified body just like what the Lord has. But in the meantime, He provided a way whereby we can have a wholesome, whole, but vi- full of vitality body in this world. So lift your hands towards Shannon right now. We're going to anoint him with oil. And then we'll take up the offering. Because James says, if there be any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church and pray the prayer of faith. And if there be any sins, they shall be forgiven and they shall be made well in Jesus' name. So, Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just command that this body line up to what Jesus' body is. Jesus had a healthy body. It was a healthy body that he took those stripes. It was a healthy body that bore the marks in the in the in the results of Calvary, Father, because of the sins that were laid upon Jesus Christ. So right now, body and Shannon's um, being here in the name of Jesus Christ, you have to come together. You have to come in alignment with what the Word says He is. And the Word says, by His stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise Him, church. And if there be anyone else that needs a physical touch in their body, stand up and receive it right now. I believe in for God to heal me and my body. And I receive it and I thank you for it, Lord. And we just give you the glory and honor in Christ's lovely name. And the church declared, amen. Father, we just pray over the offering that you minister through the gifts and the giving of those that are serving you by, their, um, by what you've blessed them with. And Father, we, it, we just thank you because it is an act of worship to give unto the Lord with a joyful heart. And Father, we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Children, you're dismissed to go with your children's pastors. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. If you'll stand with me. Praise his holy name. Pick up your Bible. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word. 
and lift it up high. Your Bible may be in your phone. It is a Bible, probably up. Most of you have the Bible app, some type of Bible app on your phone. But let's, let's declare this to the enemy, to the world, and to our fellow brothers and sisters across this globe. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It never changes so that it will change me. And it will if we allow it. Amen. Now our text today is 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Father, we just come once again in the name of Jesus Christ. Minister your word through the preaching of the word of God and anoint me to give that that you've laid upon my heart. And Father, I thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we just stop every blind and dumb spirit that comes right now to hinder the work of the word of God. We cast forth every demonic spirit that would come and try to take our minds off of what Jesus Christ has done for us and what the Holy Spirit wants us to hear today. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you and we give you glory and honor. And the church said once again, amen and amen. You may be seated. The title of today's message is simply this, Are You in the Faith? In 1973, Jay Adams, author of many books in Christian counseling, gave a series of lectures at a leading evangelical seminary emphasizing the necessity to stick strictly to the Bible and <clears throat> avoid psychological influence, influences. Adams told the students and faculty this. Listen, I thought this was so poignant because it shows you just how far we have strayed from the Word of God. He said, I do not think I need to labor this point. I am sure the reason why I was invited to deliver these lectures in the first place was because of our common conviction about this vital imperative. Adams then made his conviction crystal clear as he went on addressing the, the, uh, the uh, crowd, or, or, yeah, the crowd that day, and those that were seated in the auditorium. He said, in my opinion, advocating, allowing, and practicing psychiatric and psychoanalytical uh, dogmas within the church is every bit as pagan and heretical and therefore perilous, as, as propagating the teachings of some of the most bizarre cults. The only vital difference is that the cults are less dangerous because their errors are more identifiable. And he warned that group of future pastors when he said this, members of your congregations, elders, deacons, and fellow ministers, not to speak of Christians who are psychiatrists and psychologists, may turn on the pressure and try to dissuade you from the resolute determination to make your counseling wholly scriptural. And they may insist that you cannot use the Bible as a textbook for counseling. Try to shame you into thinking that the Holy Spirit has inadequately trained you for the work. Tempt you to buy all sorts of, sh of uh, shiny psychological wares to use as agents to the Bible and generally demand that you abandon what, may what they may simply or openly state to be an arrogant, insular, and, and hopelessly inadequate basis for counseling. And then he said this, they may even warn and threaten as they caricature the biblical method. In other words, they'll say something like this, think of the harm that you may do by simply handling out Bible verses like prescriptions or pills. But since 1973, however, the church almost as a whole has embraced the pagan influences of psychology, and doing so they have forsaken the Word of God. For the two, this is important to understand, cannot coincide because they are opposites. Once you leave the Word of God, all you're dealing with is the wisdom of mankind. And the wisdom of man could not save us. The wisdom of man cannot change the heart of man. The wisdom of man cannot set right that which is wrong in the soul. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can heal the soul. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can heal the broken heart. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can take that which has been sown in corruption and change it into something beautiful that will one day be raised in corruption. You cannot talk 
sin, the sin nature out of a man or woman or a child. You cannot legislate it out of them. You cannot be enough and uh, pr present enough punitive damages to their physical being and their emotion that can drive that out of them. There's only one thing that can change the heart of man. There's only one answer for the soul of man that is sick and decaying and dying on a daily basis and that is the risen Jesus Christ who gave it all on Calvary's cross. Amen? Amen. You see, the sin problem is so severe that if it could have been talked out, Jesus Christ would not have had to go to the cross. Even God himself could not speak our salvation into existence because his word, his law said, the soul that sins shall surely die. You want to see what's happening in America right now? I can tell you what's happening. It's because God has forsaken America and the we're, look, we're going on the third generation of people who have been raised without God. Look at the great reformers. And I'm talking about those in the 20th century like Martin Luther King and those. They didn't go burning buildings down. They didn't perpetrate violence even though violence was perpetrated against them. And in the end, they made such a radical statement and a transference in this country because they were founded upon that God made all men equal. But that's not what we're seeing today. We're not seeing that at all. It's just all about me, 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 me. And it's about taking what you have worked for and giving it to me that does not work. It's just about anarchy. And I'm going to tell you something. Anarchy, is roots are literally in Satanism. In fact, if you look at the anarchist symbol, it's a symbol of Satanism. It's the same thing. Every man's doing that which is right in his own sight. It's not doing what is right, what, what God has called us to do and called us to be. So if there's any hope in this country, it's Jesus Christ. And it's time for the church to stand up and say what we need is we need to get back and focus on God because he's the only one that can heal the land. And he's already made provision by that through his son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life. Man didn't take it from him. The Bible's clear on that. In fact, didn't he tell him in the Garden of Gethsemane the night he was betrayed and he told Peter to put up that sword? He said, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels right now that would defend me? It was love that kept him on the cross because at any moment he could have stepped off the cross and pronounced judgment and said, that's it. And all of mankind would have been swallowed up by the pit of hell. It was love that kept him on the cross. It was love where he didn't justify himself and didn't even make a, a defense of himself when he was being uh, uh, humiliated and his beard plucked out, his hair pl pulled out, crowns of thorns plastered upon his head. The Bible's clear he went like a lamb to slaughter because it was the only way that you and I could ever be redeemed. And it's not just the black family that's been destroyed by humanism, but it's all families. You look at the writers today, they're just not minorities. It's about a half and half. It's Americans who don't know God. So we must see and really must do what Paul said, examine ourselves. Notice there needs to be an examination in that first part of the verse 5 where he says examine yourselves. This phrase was used by Paul because there was occasion to fear that many of them had been deceived. Remember when you go back and study the 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it was all about counteracting the evil of false doctrine that had come in there and they were going back and they were even allowing a, a, a member of the church who had married his father's wife. And they had done nothing about it. They just accepted it. In fact, it was in the Roman world of that day, it was a, not a good thing to be called a Corinthian. It was definitely a moniker of shame and evil because even in pagan society, what was going on in Corinth was, was not even recognized in pagan society. Even the pagans said, this is wrong. 
But it was all built on, remember, the temple of Diana. You had temple prostitution and, and the worship of literally false gods and self and the fertility gods that were all part of these false entities. So such was the state of the church in Corinth. The false apostles had sowed seeds of confusion which would ultimately lead to destruction. And I'm going to tell you something. If there's ever been confusion, it is in those sciences so-called of psychology and psychiatry. Because there's, you'll have one person that says, this is the way to bring healing to the heart and soul of man. And then that's counter, counter, uh, 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 countered by something totally different than that. Another way to so-called bring healing to the heart of man and the soul and to the mind. That right there tells you where the author is. It sows nothing but confusion. There is no help. Can they point out where somebody's uh, 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 problems may have started from? Yes, but they don't have an answer. That's what I'm trying to get across here. There is no answer in those things. There's no answer in science to what ails man. The only thing that it can, can solve what ails mankind is a spiritual rebirth, and that is brought about solely through Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary. Amen? See, all Christians should then examine the foundation of their hope of eternal salvation. Notice, we are to examine ourselves and not others. All too often that's been a problem in the church as you had people that would examine and say, you know, that person doesn't toe the line like I do. Well, I got news for you. Nobody tolls the line like Jesus did. Not a one of you, nor me. Now, does that give us an excuse to go out and do our own thing? Does it? Absolutely not. Because He is our example. That means we're to allow His life to be lived so much in our life that I don't want to do those things that cause destruction and death and tear families apart and ruin our own lives. But what I want to do is follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I do that, then I lift everything and everyone up around me to the glory of the Father in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we got to do. That's why Paul said, examine yourselves. You see, when the word examine is used in an evil sense, it means to tempt. However, here it is used in a good sense and has the meaning to try and is followed by the synonym to, uh, to subject to a test as coins are tested to determine their genuineness and the full weight. It's interesting to note, and I'm not a numericist at all. I'm a num I can't remember the name. Numericist, a person that collects coins. Let's do it in lay, person, lay terms. But you know why our coins have the edges on them? Back when they were gold and silver, they had the grooves. Because you couldn't have someone just scraping the outer edge of the coin just a little bit. Well, if he did that on enough coins... Because even a little bit, you're doing what? You're stealing. So not everybody had a, had a, a essay or scale there, and you could weigh. So the, um, the government started minting the coins with the edges on there because if somebody was peeling the edges off, the ridges would be filed down, and you would notice that. Isn't that a, interesting? So if you're ever on Jeopardy and that comes up, I just gave you the answer. <laughs> Amen? Uh, Alex, what is uh, 500 for coins? You see, the word Paul uses here for approve in the Greek means to put something to the test in order to approve it. So Paul is saying to the Corinthians, you need to put your faith to the test because you'll find out that if it's real, then my apostleship is real. Because each and every one of us, Paul is saying, how do you know you're still in the faith? It can't be, you won't know until it's put to the test. Until it's put in the essayer's scales. Until it's put under fire, do you know that you have real faith? Faith that's not just in your head alone, but faith that's anchored in the knowledge that you're in Christ Jesus. Amen? Our faith is never real until it's tested. Then you understand if it is. You see, Paul's authority had been challenged by many in Corinth. The dissidents had demanded proof that Christ did indeed speak through the Apostle Paul or if he actually was an apostle. See, Paul's answer to them focuses attention on the indwelling Christ who is powerful within 
and among his people and will deal with those who reject one whom he sends. And I'm going to tell you something right there. Don't support false apostles and false teachers. You need to understand the Word of God. If you understand God's Word, you won't be led astray. But it's not my job or your job to bring them to account, so to speak. Now, if they're in a public forum preaching heretical teachings, then we're to address that as ministers and even as those that are not in the fivefold ministry, you need to address it with the Word of God. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's what God's Word says. That is the standard by which we judge everything. But I am not sit here to make sure that they get their, their just dessert, so to speak, in this life. God will determine that. And I'll tell you something, He doesn't often wait till the end either. Because God will honor His Word even above His name. And He will not let either one be thrown around flippantly. He's a merciful God and He's patient and gracious. But there comes a time when, because He's God, enough is enough. And He will see that His name is held up. And that His Word evermore so. So Paul calls the Corinthians to put themselves to the <clears throat> test of exploring the inner, real, the inner reality. So do you not realize, he said, that Christ Jesus is in you? In other words, if Jesus was within them, he would, be, they, uh, he would bear witness, he being Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to the validity of the message Paul was preaching. And it's like that with any pastor. If you hear someone that is preaching the true gospel and it's centered upon God's Word, your spirit, if you're being led of the Spirit and you're reading the Bible every day through and allowing the Bible to interpret the Bible, then it will bear witness with you or it will be rejected. Likewise with me. I tell you from time to time, and quite often I say, don't just take what I say at face value. Take it against the Word of God. Let the Word of God be the final arbitrator of whether I'm telling you is truth or a falsity. And if I'm telling you a falsity, then you need to come back and meet me face to face and say, Pastor, you're wrong on this. I think this is why. We're to do it love just like I do. I don't stand up here and scream at you and holler at you just to do that. In fact, I don't scream and holler at all. I know I'm loud, but that's called passion. Something that the millennial generation is afraid of. But I'm going to tell you what, as long as I pastor this church, we're not going to have a safe space in this church, okay? The whole sanctuary is a safe space. So get used to it. Amen? Now observe here in this scripture the faith. Whether you be in the faith, refers to faith in Jesus Christ and the promises, think about that now, underscore that in your mind, and the promises of God through Him, which is the greatest distinguishing characteristic of a true believer. You know what that means? That means you're going to trust God because if God promised it, He's going to fulfill it. Or He already has. In fact, when you call, look at everything that you have need of, now get this in your mind. It's not that God has to fulfill it yet in your life. Let me, in, let, you, let, me let you in on a little secret here. It's already been fulfilled in what Christ did on the cross. In other words, whatever you have need of, the song we sang, He won the victory. Everything you have need of is already waiting to be given to you. The reason we don't have victory is because we don't receive it. Through any myriad of, of excuses why we don't receive what God has already purchased through Jesus Christ. Substitutionary death on the cross. When he said it is finished, he meant just that. Everything you had need of. Right then and there, the, the death knell was given to Satan and all those who accompanied him. His head was crushed the moment Jesus Christ gave up the ghost. And he gave it up. He didn't. That yet, in other words, the enemy didn't pull it from him. He freely gave up his life. In other words, the Father had said, I accept the great sacrifice. I accept the, the sacrifice that all the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to, and that was my son, freely laying his life down to redeem you and me. 
Can I tell you something? For anybody that ends up in hell, it's not because God did not make a way, and it's not because God and His love and mercy and grace did not constantly woo them to His heart. It's because they have rejected the payment God made for them. You know, people that are in hell, what they're really saying is, I can pay it myself. Boy, I tell you what, that's a debt that you'll never repay, but you'll forever regret it if you turn your heart and close the door of it to the love of the Father through Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that I gave my heart in 1983 to the Lord Jesus. There's times I got hot and I'd cooled off a little bit. I'd get hot and I never cool off. I never left church, never left serving God. But in my heart I didn't have the passion I'd have at different times. But I'm so thankful that his love for me wasn't dependent on my love for him. Or we'd all be in trouble. But my love is being made. It's not there yet, but it's being made perfect in him. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's good preaching, even if I say so myself. <laughs> to try and test oneself is simple enough. A few honest questions, honestly answered, soon reveals where one stands. You see, there is the faith, the faith. Notice the definite article in the Greek is even there. The faith. Not just faith in your own abilities, faith in some omniscient being out there somewhere, out there who just kind of started up the clock and just let it go. No, the faith means specifically your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross and His resurrection. That's what that means. Okay? Itself which stands for the gospel, the entire embodiment of that which we refer to as Christianity. So do I believe it in total? Ask yourself that. Do I believe what Jesus Christ said about Himself in totality? Do I believe the whole message? Then do I receive it without change or of any kind? In other words, do I say, well, I really don't like this part about obedience, so I'm going to leave that out. If you're doing that, then you really don't believe. Do I reject some or any part of it? Does my heart truly believe the gospel of Christ? Do I trust it? Is my confidence full and strong in what Jesus Christ did? So what it all means is this, it is absolutely imperative that one believes that Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. That as a man, even though fully God, he died on Calvary to pay the sin debt of humanity and that he was raised from the dead. That is the gospel, that is the guts of the gospel that Jesus Christ delivered to mankind. It's that simple. If you deviate from that, you're not really worshiping and putting your faith and trust in the Jesus Christ of Scripture, of the Bible. Now look at faith has many aspects. It implies our recognition then that we are sinners and thus unable of ourselves to forsake evil and to do good. For those out there who think I am a good person, the Bible says if you have ever sinned, Sin is literally an easy definition as departing from the standard that God has raised up. His law, His standard of morality. Not your standard, not my standard, not somebody's standard over here, but what the Bible says is right and wrong. If you've ever, even in thought one time, looked upon someone, whether you're a man or a woman, in lust, you've broken the law of God. If you've ever coveted, and can I tell you something? That sin is on display in all our cities burning today. That's called the sin of coveting. Now, should we protest and inadequacies, inadequacies and, and injustices in our nation? Absolutely. In fact, the Constitution provides that we are able to do that. But that does not give us free license to take out and to live out and to gratify that sin of covetousness by burning down, destroying, after you've looted, 
what other people have worked hard to do, whether it's a corporation or whether it's a small mom and pop business. Listen, corporations, they employ people. But when their stores are burned, do you think they're apt to want to go back into that neighborhood and rebuild that store, even though they have the money? Many times they will not. And as far as mom and pop go, listen, uh, a, a corporation can withstand some writing because they got enough money to rebuild. But a mom and pop does not because no insurance company, listen to me out there, no insurance company pays for loss during a riot. You got to absorb that all yourself. Shame on these mayors that just sit there in, and, and with their own words incite more violence and looting and thieving and destruction of private property. Now, I'll give our mayor here, and I don't live in Atlanta, but she is the only Democrat mayor that said anything that made any sense and was passionate about and calling them what they are, thieves and thugs and looters. I commend her for that. But that's the only one. How sad is that? I'll tell you what, mayors across this great nation, if you don't get a hold of this and you governors in these states, especially these blue states, as that's the ones I'm referring to, if you don't get a hold of it, I can tell you what's going to happen. The President of the United States will declare martial law to get everything under, and you don't want martial law because then it's not just National Guard. He can deploy the army, and that will bring an end to things. But I'm always fearful of any power. That wouldn't be a power grab because at times you've got to do that to save a country. But even in a democratic republic like ours, we can see it because of the history, all we got to do is look at the history of Washington D.C. itself. When it attains power, it seldom ever gives it back to the people. So get a hold of these cities that you are supposedly in charge of and bring law and order to your cities. Amen? The American people need to rise up about that. Amongst other things, I could go into another direction right here, just what I think about the coronavirus and why that was implemented, and I have several ideas why. But I'll just let you ask me later because I'm not going to get off message today. You see, Socrates said this, that great Greek philosopher. He said, you might hold that knowledge and virtue are much the same so that to know what is right leads people to do right. But Paul, listen to me, would not have agreed at all with that statement. You see, for faith implies that we have come to see ourselves as sinful and also that we recognize that God has provided for our forgiveness through what Christ's death has done for us. I'm going to tell you right now, until a person sees their own worthlessness outside of Christ, until they see their own sinfulness and their own wickedness, they'll never seek and ask and search out the Savior. You know the hardest people to win to Christ? It's not even those out there rioting. Now many of them have rejected and have said no, maybe for the last time. Those will be the ones that because they have rejected the truth, when the rapture happens, God gives them over to strong delusion to believe the lie that they may be damned. God's not wanting them to be damned. He's just giving them what their heart's desire is. But a lot of those out in these streets today, they've never really had the true gospel preached to them. But the hardest ones to win to Christ are those that are religious. And a lot of them don't even sit in churches anymore, but they're religious. I had a guy when I pulled up here about a month ago, and I talked to him, and he, he said he was a Christian, but he wouldn't go to church. And the more I talked to him, his, his uh, theology, not theology, his biblical doctrine was so twisted, so mangled up, he didn't even know what it meant to be a Christian. But he would believe and did believe that he's a believer, that he's a Christian. But you see, until you get that type of person lost, you know what I mean by that? 
until they see themselves as lost and undone, they'll never seek out the Savior that the Bible lifts up, and that's Jesus Christ. It's hard to win religious people because the doing of religion is probably the strongest and largest and greatest expanse of a narcotic there ever has been because it lies to you. It makes you feel like I've done something good. So God says, kudos for you. Come on in. It's not based on your good works. It never has been. It's based on your heart realizing I'm lost and undone and on my way to hell and justly so. But God loved me so much, he made a way that I don't have to go there. Amen? Thus, the good news is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes in Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power. Think about that. That word power implies it is unstoppable if it's allowed to do the work in the life of the individual. So for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what Paul declares. That's what the Holy Spirit through the Paul declared to us here and today. Say faith means then commitment. That's where the rubber meets the road for a lot of people. That's why you see a lot of people claim to be Christians, even those that go to church and their lives. Oh, they're on the surface, they may look better. But really when you get down to it, they go out and do the same things those in the world that are lost do on a, on a regular basis, almost on a, on a daily basis. In other words, their faith that they say they have has not impacted their lives whatsoever. But even to the smallest and the newest babe in Christ, the, the newest believer, God is always moving you through the Holy Spirit to that place where you'll make that commitment to the, not about salvation, if you're saved, that's already been done, but a, that commitment to follow Jesus Christ no matter the cost. If you're not willing to follow Jesus Christ no matter the cost, eventually you'll withdraw back. You will. You'll withdraw back and you won't follow Jesus anymore. Oh, you'll follow a Jesus, quote unquote, that you've made up in your mind, but you will not follow him. Because if you're going to stay His, He said, you'll keep my commandments. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He wasn't talking about Pharisaical law, which He never talked about that anyways. What He was saying is, by keeping His commandments, you'll follow Him because Him, Jesus Christ being in you, you then are a law keeper. Even though you'll never ever keep all the commandments, even as a believer. You'll stumble from time to time, but you will not be ruled by that. You will not be led by your own selfish desires. You'll be led by the Spirit of God because you're led by the Holy Spirit. You are now a law keeper because you're in Christ and Christ kept the law not for himself, but for you and me. Amen? Do we understand that? You're already a law keeper if you're in Christ and you're following him. Do you realize in this church you get a lot of doctrinal training that you won't get in most places? And I don't say that to lift myself up. It's just a fact. I know. I've been to a lot of churches. Now notice, and I'll move along quickly. Prove your own selves. Presents a very strong term. See, the word used here is stronger than the word examine. The word prove refers to essay, essaying as an essayer or trying metals by the powerful action of heat. So the idea here is that they should make the most through the trial of their faith to see if it would stand the test. So the best way to prove our salvation is to subject it to the actual trial, listen here, in the various duties and responsibilities of life. You know what that is saying to you and I? You know what I'm saying? Is 
if your faith is going to be real, then let it be tried through the fire and purified in your daily walk with the Lord. That means when someone makes you mad, and listen, people make you mad. People make me mad. I'm sure I made you mad at one time or the other. Have I not? I'm sure I have. But you know what? We allow the Holy Spirit to bring out and perform the work that Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit is going to do in our lives. In other words, to make us more like Christ. Your faith is never going to be, you know, some people have a lot of big faith until a real trial test comes, then they lose it all. And I'm not saying we're void of emotions, because we all have emotions, but you know what? If you allow yourself to hang on to God, even in the worst trials of life, you'll find your faith is being purified. Instead of going into the valley and staying there, you're maybe hit the valley for a short season. And I, when I say season, I don't mean months. I don't mean even weeks. I don't even mean days. You won't allow yourself to be there. And you'll say, you know what? I'm going on with Christ. And the next thing you know, you've, you're out of the valley and you're marching up and your faith has been made stronger because you now trust God even more than you did before that trial. It's not the big things in life that will cause us to lose out. Jesus said, I believe it said it was this way, He said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things they eat at you day after day. If you allow those to eat after you, they'll sap you just like an insect in your garden. If you don't have some type of pesticide, you can have big beautiful squash plant putting out squash and you go out there the next day and the squash is like this. It's already dead. A worm or some type of insect has chewed through the stem, sucked it of all its life. But we don't have to do that, do we? Have a made up mind. I'm going to serve God come what may. And he honors a commitment like that. And then you look here at the word reprobate. And what it means to be reprobate, he says, know you not your own selves. In other words, he says, prove yourselves. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Proclaims in no uncertain terms the total salvation, which is Jesus Christ, and that he lives within our heart. Thus, the verdict is simple. If Jesus Christ does not live, live within you, then you are a reprobate. And the word reprobate min, uh, literally means one rejected. Not because God doesn't love you, but because you have rejected Him, His only way for you to come to know Him, so He can do nothing else but reject you. Not that He takes pleasure in it. In fact, God, it's, the Bible's clear, God has no pleasure in those that go to hell. He's not excited about that. He's not going to serve you right. If you end up there, it's because you made yourself as one rejected. So there's no middle ground here. Either one knows Christ and is therefore saved, or else they don't know Him, and in the eyes of God, they are a reprobate, rejected. Bringing this to a close. Stand with me, please. So you thought I was going to go a long time today, didn't you? But... I got a lot here in my conclusion, so. See, Paul, Paul sums it all up in this one statement. Are you in Christ? Because that's what he's really talking about here. When he says examine yourselves, the, the, the bottom line, he's saying, are you in Christ? Is Christ then vitally living in you? If you're in Him, He is doing just that. He is living through the person of the Holy Spirit in you. So frequently in Paul's teaching, the function of Jesus and the Spirit are identified so much so that being in Christ is simply another way of speaking of being in the Spirit. And I got some examples here. Let's look at the first one. Next scripture, please. There we go. Yea, doubtless, 
And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom, I'm, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. That is Paul talking about he had the best education, not only in the liberal arts, which was from Troas, but in the religious, because he was a student of Gamaliel. In fact, he was going to be the one that the mantle from Gamaliel would have been placed upon was Saul, who became Paul. But notice what he did. He said, I count it dung. That means, you know what it means. It means crap. <laughs> and you know the sad thing was, John Crapper, when he invented the toilet, never thought he would become synonymous with waste, did he? There you go, another little thing if you're ever on Jeopardy. That's where the term the Crapper came from. John Crapper. That I may win Christ. In other words, that I may be in Christ. But look at this, the next scripture. And be found in him, in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Next scripture. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There again you see the, 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 the sameness there. In Christ, in the Holy Spirit. When Christ who is our life, that means how's He our life? We're in Him. He lives in us. Then you also will appear with Him in glory. But notice this. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall, be, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. See there? It's Christ and the Holy Spirit. They dwell in you because they're part of the same triune God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're, they're inseparable in how they work, so to speak. Their purpose is one and the same. That is to mature you, to constantly mold you into the image of the one who died for you. Jesus Christ. Let's look at it again, the next one. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Pit, pitiable. King James says miserable. For, who, who, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The Spirit is in you, and sowing to the Spirit means being led of the Spirit. Go on. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you're led of the Spirit, you'll have the joy of the Spirit. But then again he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. So if you're being led of the Spirit and you're rejoicing in the Spirit, it's because the Spirit of the one who died on Calvary's cross now lives in you. In other words, Jesus Christ is edified by the Holy Spirit living in you, the third member of the triune Godhead. So the Holy Spirit, we rejoice in the Holy Spirit, and then also at the same time we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth in Christ, there again, you're in Christ, Paul's in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit living in them. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all in all. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son. In Christ, we have fellowship with the Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. What Paul's saying there, the reason the Jews of his day rejected Christ is they had a veil because they were not in Christ. They had rejected their Messiah, so the veil continues even unto this hour for the most part. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, 
you get His sanctification. Called to be saints. If you're saved, you're a saint. You don't have to wait till somebody makes you one. God did it. With all who in every... With all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, the offering of the Gentiles might be as acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Because you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit's in you. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Bringing it quickly here. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, every single thing done on this earth by the triune God is done through the office, the ministry, and the person of the Holy Spirit. He does it only through, and I'm closing with this, the legal confines of Calvary and the resurrection. For Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because those who try to live by a law, whether it's the law of God or a law of their own making, the end result is death and eternal separation from God. But those of us who are led by the Spirit for the law there, that's a law of the Spirit of life. If you're going to live for Christ, you live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. In other words, He's in you. You allow the Holy Spirit to lead you ever to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have life and life more abundantly. Amen? So take this, what I've said today, and realize you're in Him, and He's in you. Then forsake your own way. I don't care how righteous or how good or how well thought out that way for your life is, if it's not following the Lord Jesus Christ and you being led of the Holy Spirit, it will always end in failure and shipwreck. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, allow Him to guide us in everything we say, everything we do, everything we hear. And by the way, don't all too all, and I happen, heck, it happens in my own life at times. I think I got some uh, leading of the Holy Spirit, but when I take it to the Word of God, it's contrary to Scripture. You can never take a Bible verse out of Scripture and make it mean something that will take away and be detrimental to any other part of the Word of God because they're cohesive, they're in unity. So even if you have good thoughts of maybe a ministry or anything, take it to the Word of God. That's how you're led by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never lead you against revealed will of God in His Bible. So, Father, we thank you for this time together. I pray that you minister to each and every one of us. Help us to understand what it means to be in Christ and to examine ourselves, whether we really are in Christ or we're just following another version of Jesus. Father, I thank you and I praise you for those that are here today, those that are watching. I pray that you minister to all of us. Let us just, let that, let that fire of, of just being a believer, let the passion rise up in us that we tell people in these last hours of these last days about Jesus Christ and how much the Father loves them. And Father, we thank you for this and we worship you and magnify your precious name. And again, the church said, Amen. You're dismissed. Go in the love and admonition and the power and leading of the Holy Spirit. And pray that God said someone to your doorstep this week that needs the Lord. To a father's house, there's lots of room. No one will be turned out, no matter what you've done, or where you may have been. Standing arms wide open, so won't you come on in, come on in. To my father's house, 
there's lots of room No one will be turned out No matter what you've done Or where you may have been Standing arms wide open So won't you come on in Cause here's love at the table there's room for everyone Come on in. to my father's house there's lots of room no one will be turned out no matter what you 